Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Bard Graduate Center for today's lunchtime talk. Um, before I introduce the speaker, just to let you know that the Bard Graduate Center on West 86th Street on the island of Manhattan, Manahata, respectfully acknowledges that its intellectual life unfolds on the ancestral lands of the Lenny Lenape people and also that its buildings sit just a few yards beyond the furthest fields of what was Seneca Village uh, before Central Park uh, buried it uh, until uh, scholars of the later 20th century uh, recovered its history. So we're here today with Paul Kaplan, who is professor of art history in the School of Humanities at Purchase College of the State University of New York, where he uh, is a distinguished professor and has been there for many years. Uh, his PhD is in Italian Renaissance art. Um, and its topic, which in 1983 was much more unusual than it is today, was ruler, saint, and servant, Blacks in European art to 1520. And his career has unfolded uh, really alongside with the development of the field of studying Black figures in European art and increasingly American art from, uh, from that period, from the early 80s until now. Uh, his publications, and there are a, a raft of them, just to give you some of the most current ones, um, The Image of the Enslaved African and European Art, which is going into the Oxford Encyclopedia of slavery, slave trade, and the diaspora, forthcoming in 2022. Monuments to Tyranny, Issues of Race and Power in 19th Century American Responses to Early Modern Italian Public Sculpture in a volume entitled Republics and Empires, Italian and American Art in Transnational Perspective, uh, which is coming out in 2021. He's one of the editors uh, of that volume. Black Women in Early Modern European Art and Culture in the Routledge Companion to Black Women's Cultural Histories, and his own monograph from just last year, Contraband Guides, Race, Transatlantic Culture and the Arts in the Civil War Era, published by Penn State University Press. Uh, there are lots and lots of these, but just to give you a sense of some of the areas in which he works on them, I'll, I'll uh, I'll alert you to current projects of his, uh, and they are a black Jewish astrologer in a German Renaissance manuscript, Juan Bianco, a black African commander in the Venetian forces at Fornovo, from subject peoples to subjugated continents, Africa and America in presidential imagery from Washington to Roosevelt, and Africa in Venice, a collaborative book project with the great uh, Shaul Basi. So um, we really have the pleasure of someone with an encyclopedic picture of the topic. Um, and I have to say that there's another reason why um, it's a pleasure to welcome Professor Kaplan here. And that is that we, um, we joke to ourselves that A.B. Varborg is our patron saint and that we always have uh, a Varborg lecture uh, every year at the Bard Graduate Center. And uh, I think it's, it's particularly interesting to have the Varborg lecture be about a Warburg uh, who lived in the United States and who was black uh, and an artist. Uh, and on that note, it's my, uh, well, before I introduce uh, Professor Kaplan, just a note on the structure of today. And that is um, the talk will be roughly about 30 minutes. We will then invite a group of colleagues from the Bard Graduate Center who are as if sitting around the seminar table to unmute themselves and turn their video cameras on. Uh, and they'll have some questions for the speaker. And then we will, of course, always be monitoring the Q&A for those of you at home uh, who have questions. And so on that note, uh, it's my pleasure to invite uh, Paul Kaplan to speak from Stone to Parry and the African-American sculpture Eugene Eugène Warburg in Europe, 1853 to 1859. Thank you very much, Peter, uh, uh, for a very kind uh, introduction, but uh, uh, good to have some sense of 
my, some would call it range, some would call it temerity in uh, moving into many different areas, many different chronological and geographic periods in the history of art. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me today. Since uh, Peter brought up my recent book, I just want to uh, push it onto my tiny screen for a moment, uh, Contraband Guides. Um, this uh, talk is adapted from uh, a long chapter, chapter two of the book, uh, which uh, deals with uh, Eugène Warburg, um, uh, but it has many other things that if you're interested in this material, uh, you might also be curious about. Uh, I'll also make one other preliminary comment. Uh, never quite clear how to pronounce our subject's name in a talk like this. Francophone man who spent an important part of his life in an Anglophone environment later on. I'll pronounce his first name as Eugène, but his last name in an Anglicized version of Warburg. Okay. Only three works of art are known to survive from the hand of the African-American sculptor Eugène Warburg, 1825, 26 to 1859. But they provide valuable testimony to his remarkable and intense, if short, career. I wanna take you through this career with a special emphasis on his last six years in Paris, London, and Rome. But I'll begin in New Orleans, inside the Cathedral of Saint Louis. In 1850, Warburg designed and installed a vast marble floor of black, gray, and white squares, the fruit of his initial training as a stoneworker. Born into bondage, but manumitted as a small child, Warburg was the son of a German Jewish immigrant father and a mixed race enslaved mother. In light of that parentage, the array of tones in the cathedral floor can serve as a reminder of Warburg's complex ancestry and, as we will see, his own sometimes fluid racial position. However, by 1850, Warburg was eager to shift to the production of figurative sculpture, and he was soon to move to Europe to carry out that project. Eugène Warburg is a very early instance of an American of African descent, and for that matter, of Jewish descent, working in an emphatically high artistic form. Sculpture and marble was the most elevated visual medium of the mid 19th century in the US. He may have been the first African American visual artist to become an expatriate in Europe, and his departure from the US was no doubt partly prompted by the same discriminatory obstacles that led so many later African-American artists to follow his example. He was known to and supported by a wide range of influential political and cultural figures, encompassing both virulently pro-slavery and radically anti-slavery individuals. Perhaps most importantly, Warburg's image of an African-American character from the work of Harriet Beecher Stowe marks him as connected to the central political cultural controversies of the 1850s, not only in the US, but also in Europe. Warburg's story is one which links art abolition and varied conceptions of racial identity in a surprisingly intricate transatlantic setting. Warburg was also one of the few American sculptors to become involved with the design of parian or statuary porcelain a new British medium whose reproducibility and relatively modest cost aim to create a broader market for finely designed works of sculpture. The written sources on Warburg are extremely fragmentary. Practically no personal papers survive. But from his lifetime and shortly thereafter, there are quite a number of newspaper pieces that treat his career. And he's also cited in a few American memoirs of European travel. A little known letter by Harriet Beecher Stowe discusses Warburg. But after 1875, he was largely forgotten except for a mini biography in Rodolphe Lucien de Dunes 1911 book in French about notable New Orleanians of color. 
It was through De Dune that some memory of Warburg was preserved. And in the 1960s and 70s, several New Orleans historians unearthed further valuable archival evidence and newspaper materials. Newly digitized newspaper collections and the recent reappearance of a Parian work by Warburg have allowed me to amplify what we know of the sculptor and correct certain misunderstandings about his work and life. Eugène's father, the German Jew Daniel Warburg, 1789 to 1860, was apparently the first of his family to come to the US. Later on, of course, the Warburgs would leave a major mark on American banking and other fields. And Daniel, uh, and therefore Eugène, uh, were in fact distant cousins of the famous German cultural historian, A.B. Warburg, who like Eugène was drawn to Italy. Daniel left the Hamburg area and settled in New Orleans by 1821. Some years later, he made a public declaration that he practiced no religion. Quite affluent as a commission merchant and real estate investor in the early 1830s, Daniel lost most of his fortune in the panic of 1837, entered bankruptcy, and never recovered his wealth. Soon after his arrival in New Orleans, Daniel took an enslaved mistress, Marie Rose Blondeau, and Marie Rose and her mother, Venus, came from Santiago, Cuba, and perhaps originally from Haiti. Daniel and Marie Rose had five children, and by 1837, the year of her early death, she must have been free as she then owned a slave herself. Eugène was the oldest child, born in 1825 or early 1826, and at the age of four years in 1830, he was emancipated. At Eugène's manumission, his father and the ambitious French immigrant Pierre Soulet, 1801 to 1870, served as guarantors for the boy's future solvency and pledged to provide him with a trade. That trade was marble cutting, and Eugène clearly took to it. He received instruction from one of Soulet's contacts, Philippe Garbet, a French sculptor who had studied in 1838 with the Danish master, Bertel Thorvaldsen, the dominant neoclassical sculptor in Rome. In 1849, Eugène set up his own shop, but apart from the marble pavement of the cathedral, it has proved difficult to attribute any particular surviving works to Warburg in New Orleans. De Dune in 1911 wrote of busts of quote, generals, magistrates, and other notables, unquote, and of masterpieces in the old cemeteries of the city. In December of 1850, Warburg raffled a statue he carved of Ganymede as cupbearer to Jupiter. The estimated value was $500, but we have no record of the result of the raffle and the work itself is untraced. Torvaldsen, had favored this particular subject, and Warburg might have known this through his teacher Garbet, or perhaps through a new arrival in New Orleans, the Milanese Attila Pirelli, who had been trained by one of Thorvaldson's associates, Pietro Galli, and Galli in turn probably worked on one or more of Thorvaldson's six Ganymede sculptures. I show you one here. Warburg's lost Ganymede, even if it did not sell, was admired. The New Orleans Bee in 1850 wrote of, quote, this exquisite specimen of sculpture by a young Creole of our city who would soon attain deserved excellence. Now, perhaps the raffle was already part of a plan to raise money to cross the Atlantic. De Dune affirms that Warburg's racial status held him back in New Orleans, in his New Orleans career. But there were certainly also more positive reasons for him to think about a European sojourn. In the middle of the 19th century, ambitious American sculptors typically sought to study in Italy and travel in Europe, and their sponsors and patrons often helped them to do so. Warburg's father was European born. His teacher Garbet was French and had studied in Rome. Warburg's godfather, Pierre Soulet, was French and was now an extremely influential politician. Furthermore, two other New Orleanian visual artists of color, Flor Vive Foix, a marble worker, and Julien Hudson, 
a painter had already made brief visits to Paris during the 1830s. To finance his transatlantic voyage, Eugène and his now impoverished father turned to one of the few remaining family assets. Eugène was able to realize $252 from the sale of his long deceased mother's three slaves. That both Eugène and his mother had been born into slavery themselves only heightens the cruel irony of this transaction. The sculptor left New Orleans in late November 1852 and settled in Paris. One of the letters of recommendation he carried has survived. The New Orleans architect Alexander H. Sampson, with whom Warburg had worked on the cathedral floor, recommended him to a Parisian business contact. Sampson, saying nothing of Warburg's race, described him as, quote, a sculptor by profession, that which he knows is derived only from his own intelligence, He'd like to strengthen himself in his art by working at a statue maker's. At some point, he entered the studio of Francois Geoffroy, a respected sculptor who had studied in Rome around 1830. Geoffroy, who you see here, later became a professor at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, where he was one of the teachers of Augustus St. Gaudens. Quite a few mixed race Louisianans were to be found in Paris at this juncture, ranging from a successful dramatist to a fashionable tailor. And there were other people of color in artistic circles there. Uh, see, for example, Denise Merle's recent uh, posing modernity catalog. In Paris, Warburg was part of a larger phenomenon and may have received advice and support from some of these individuals. Warburg's actual work in Paris is first attested to in the summer of 1854 by a traveling American celebrity dentist who was brought to Warburg's studio by the American consul in Paris, Duncan McRae. Uh, dentists, by the way, have long fancied themselves sculptors and taken an interest in the medium. This dentist saw a bust and some other plaster work and characterized Warburg as, quote, a colored artist having skill a very high degree, unquote. By January 1855, we hear much more in a notice, a visit to Mr. Warburg's studio in an English language Parisian paper called The American. At the very end of the Rue des Martyrs, near the Barrière Montmartre, and at least on the site of this building, in a building destined to atelier of sculptors, we found Mr. Warburg's unpretending studio. The artist was not there and we had to be our own Cicerone. Among a number of plaster casts, the inmates of all ateliers of sculptors, the cast of a figure representing a boy about 12 years of age in a sitting posture and playing with a crab attracted our notice. We found that the artist was engaged in producing it in marble. We observed also a bust in marble intended, no doubt, for Mr. McRae, our consul in Paris, whom it resembled strikingly. The plaster cast figure of the boy and the marble bust show talent. And from what we have seen of the works of the artist, we have all reasons to believe that he will arrive at eminence. Mr. Warburg is modest. He feels that he has to study. He appreciates the works of the ancient and modern sculptors and loses no time or occasion to perfect himself. Interestingly, this piece omits any reference to race. Its author is likely to be the American's publisher, Charles Louis Fleischmann, an influential German-American who held diplomatic posts in Europe in the 1850s. In 1855, he was one of the US commissioners to the Exposition Universelle in Paris. The Exposition Universelle, an early example of the ambitious international affairs that were to play such a salient role in mid to late 19th century transatlantic culture, was crucial to the development of Warburg's career. From May to November of 1855, four of Warburg's sculptures appeared in the major Parisian and indeed European art exhibition of the year, the Salon, which in 1855 was combined with the Exposition Universelle. Warburg's four works included The Boy with a Crab, Stone Plaster, and three portrait busts. 
One of these was surely the likeness of the American consul, while another was a marble portrait of the consul's superior, the US minister to France, John Young Mason of Virginia, which until recently was regarded as the only figurative work by Warburg to have survived. 60 distinguished American expatriates and visitors to Paris underwrote the cost of this work. The portraits of John Young Mason and the consul, Duncan McRae, minister and consul, indicate that Warburg had been adopted as a kind of semi-official artist by the American government legation in Paris. And this must have been due to the intervention of Warburg's godfather, Pierre Soulet. Soulet had begun his adult life in Paris as a radical anti-royalist journalist and a comrade of the mixed race writer, Alexandre Dumas Père, whose grandmother had been an enslaved native of Saint-Domingue, Haiti. Threatened with imprisonment by the reactionary Bourbon government in 1825 for an article critical of French policy toward Haiti, Soule fled to Haiti, bearing a letter of recommendation from the most famous anti-slavery Frenchman, the Abbé Grégoire. But he did not fare well with the authorities there. He soon settled in New Orleans, by 1830, when he served as a guarantor of the very young Eugène's manumission, he was close to the Warburg family. In the 1840s, he rose in the Democratic Party, and in 1847 and again in 1849 to 53, he was a US Senator from Louisiana. He supported the pro-slavery leader, John Calhoun, but was admired even by some of his abolitionist opponents for his oratorical skills. On the last day of 1852, Harriet Beecher Stowe even speculated that Soule might change his mind about slavery and join the abolitionists, probably because Soule had recently made a significant intervention in the rescue of the illegally enslaved freeman, Solomon Northup. In Northup's famous memoir, 12 Years a Slave, he praises Soule as a disinterested and honorable figure. One wonders whether Soule's connection to Warburg, just then en route to Europe, had any impact on his assistance to Northam. But Soule did not abjure the institution of slavery. From 1853 to 55, Soule was in Madrid as the US minister to Spain and made frequent visits to Paris, working closely with Mason and McCrae. In late 1854, Soule helped draft the Ostend Manifesto, a cockeyed plan to buy or seize Cuba from the Spanish and make it a slave state within the US. But in April of 1855, this scheme collapsed in scandal and Soule resigned his post and returned to the US. This must have been a setback for Warburg, but by the end of the year, the sculptor was hard at work on a different sort of project one with the kind of mythological erotic content that harks back to his early Ganymede. The Paris American paid a second visit to his studio and described him modeling a figure, quote, of a female ornamenting her hair with the genial grape from which Bacchus pressed the heavenly juice. She is of, of the size of life in a standing position with one arm raised over her head in an act of embellishing her floating locks. In the other hand, she holds flowers and fruit. All the movements of the muscles are delicately indicated. This kind of erotic, presumably nude subject had its roots in the French Rococo and Torvaldsen perpetuated the genre, which remained common in the 1860s in French sculpture. It was a familiar trope in Paris in the 1850s, but it might've raised some eyebrows back in New Orleans given Warburg's racial position there. It suggests that Warburg was contemplating at least a slightly altered trajectory for his career, but no trace of his Acante, either in plaster or marble, has survived. By 1856, however, Warburg had begun to pursue a radically different direction. Warburg and or his work had caught the eye of Harriet Levison Gower, Duchess of Sutherland, uh, 
born in 1806, died in 1868. The Duchess, an intimate of Queen Victoria's and a fervent ally of American abolitionists, was enormously wealthy, culturally sophisticated, and influential. She and her husband, the second Duke of Sutherland, owned the most lavish townhouse in London, which contained an extensive art collection. You can see it a bit in the background. How exactly she learned of Warburg is a mystery. Neither the Paris American nor the Salon catalog had said anything of his racial background. Given her anti-slavery views, she would have had a little association with men like Soule, Mason, or McRae. Probably Warburg himself took the initiative. However, he managed to attract the Duchess's attention. In doing so, Warburg had embarked on a profoundly new course in terms of patronage. A principal source for what happened next is a passage from the 1874 memoirs of the wealthy New York lawyer, Monsell Broadhurst Bradhurst Field, who in 1855 was also employed at the American Embassy in Paris as secretary and had served as the president of all American commissioners to the 1855 Exposition Universelle. After it closed, he returned to London, where he soon, quote, received a call one day from a mulatto sculptor from New Orleans who had exhibited some very creditable and promising works at the recent Paris Exposition, unquote. Warburg, he went on, quote, had exhausted his means, had come over to London to find his duchess, hoping that she would relieve his wants and give him the advantage of her protection, end of quote. The Duchess was then in Scotland, entertaining her close friend, Harriet Beecher Stowe. Warburg was living in a squalid flat south of the Thames. To help him, Field ordered a bust and then urgently wrote to Stowe, who soon, soon returned to London and agreed, along with the Duchess of Sutherland and Lady Byron, the poet's widow and a longtime anti-slavery proponent, to move Warburg to decent quarters. So, following the tremendous transatlantic success of Uncle Tom's Cabin in 1852, had befriended the Duchess of Sutherland during a trip to Britain in 1853. In 52, at her palatial London residence, the Duchess had launched the Stafford House Address, a famous anti-slavery petition, soon signed by over half a million British women. And in May 53, Stowe was presented with the completed document in a moving ritual held in the same grand dwelling. On the heels of the publication of her second anti-slavery novel, Dread, in 1856, she returned to Britain. After a few weeks in the Highlands with the Duchess, she was back in London at the end of October, at which point Stowe certainly met with Warburg. But what did they speak about? Big Dune, in his 1911 account of Warburg's life, indicated that the Duchess of Sutherland had engaged him to make bar reliefs of scenes from Uncle Tom's cabin. No such work has ever surfaced. And this must be a misreading of a comment in a posthumous encomium to Warburg, published in 1862, three years after his death, which asserted he had worked, quote, on statues of the main characters in one of the books of Mrs. Doe, unquote. We now know that late in 1856, Warburg did produce a work depicting characters from Stowe's second slavery novel, Dread, bearing the name of one of the book's most important characters, Uncle Tiff. The work was described in the London Art Journal in September 1857, statuette of Old Tiff. A statuette of much merit and considerable interest has been recently produced by Mr. Alderman Copeland in Statuary Porcelain. It is the work of Mr. Warburg, an American sculptor of mixed blood, an artist of great ability and general intelligence who is now resident in England. The group represents Old Tiff, the hero of Mrs. Stowe's latest novel, nursing the little maiden who is the heroine of the story. And at the same time, rocking a cradle with his feet and busied with his hands. It's a striking work and cannot fail to find favor with the tens of thousands who in England and in the United States sympathize with the subjects whom Mrs. Stowe has pictured 
with so much feeling and pathos. The accomplished authoress has criticized, commented on uh, this group of Mr. Warburg's in a letter which we have perused. It is, she writes, beautifully truthful and shows how far the expression of love and fidelity may go in giving beauty to the coarsest and plainest features. That was a quote from Stowe. Certainly, writes the author of the article, the sculptor has exaggerated rather than mellowed the peculiarities of the African type. Though this work has survived because of its unfamiliar medium, a reproducible ceramic known as parian or statuary porcelain, it has escaped the attention of most scholars of 19th century American sculpture. It is inscribed with Warburg's signature, the year 1856, and on the front here, the words Uncle Tiff. The object perfectly embodies how Warburg's career intersected with the preoccupations of Stowe and Sutherland. The sculpture is 12 inches high and depicts one of the primary characters of Stowe's dread, the older male slave Tiff caring for the little white boy, Teddy, not a maiden, as the art journal writer claimed, who sits in the enslaved man's lap. In nearly all respects, the sculpture keeps closely to Stowe's text in the passage where Tiff and Teddy's, Tiff and Teddy's poor white family are introduced. Beside Teddy's mother, uh, beside Teddy's mother's bed was sitting an old Negro in whose close curling wool age had begun to sprinkle flecks of white. His countenance presented physically one of the most uncomely specimens of Negro features and would have been positively frightful had it not been redeemed by an expression of cheerful kindliness which beamed from it. His face was of ebony blackness with a wide upturned nose, a mouth of portentous size guarded by clumsy lips revealing teeth which a shark might have envied. The only fine feature was his large black eyes, which at the present were concealed by a huge pair of plated spectacles placed very low upon his nose and through which he was directing his sight upon a child's stocking that he was busily darning. At his foot was a rude cradle made of a gum tree log, hollowed out into a trough and wadded by various old fragments of flannel in which slept a very young infant. Another child of about three years of age was sitting on the Negro's knee. The figure of the old Negro was low and stooping and he wore pinned round his shoulders, a half handkerchief or shawl of red flannel arranged much as an old woman would have arranged it. One or two needles with coarse black thread dangling to them were stuck in on his shoulder and as he busily darned on the little stocking, he kept up a kind of droning intermixture of chanting and talking to the child on his knee. That's all still. Though color, especially of skin, is absent in the white marble-like sculpture, most other features from the text are apparent. A cradle, down here, the eyeglasses on the knee in this case, the darning work, the shawl, um, uh, the emphatically African features of the man. Stowe describes his visage almost as a kind of frightening caricature. Warburg is less exaggerated in his approach, concealing Tiff's teeth and the figure's age is mostly expressed in his receding hairline. The maternal affect of Tiff toward the child is in fact most appropriate to the text. For Teddy's mother expires a few pages on in the novel, and Tiff functions as the adoptive parent of Teddy and his two siblings, offering them all the tender physical and psychological care expected of a mother. Surrounded by brutal oppression and eventually adhering to the escaped slave dreads plans for an insurrection, Tiff and two of his wards survive and finally prosper, finding refuge in New York. It is notable that the nurturing Tiff rather than the more assertive dread was selected by Copeland, by Warburg, by Stowe, by Sutherland as the subject of the Parian sculpture. Copeland was a major firm in the Staffordshire potteries whose water sources were controlled by the Duke of Sutherland, 
And the Duke and Duchess were enthusiastic promoters of the industry and were themselves soon portrayed in Parian. The Duchess surely played a role in connecting Copeland and Warburg. Warburg's statuette, which retailed for 31 shillings and six, was far more sophisticated than the cheap Staffordshire figurines of characters from Uncle Tom's cabin that had been made a few years earlier. And this brings up another anomaly. While Stowe's first novel had generated all kinds of illustrations, most of which she hardly disliked, Dread, which sold just as well as its predecessor, was published in the US and Britain without illustrations. A Parian statuette was more to Stowe's taste as conveying good design to her middle-class audience for a reasonable price. And in fact, Stowe wrote a long letter to the English sculptor Joseph Durham in early November, 1856, praising this medium. Several of Durham's creations, she affirmed, quote, would be extremely popular and it seems to be a pity to confine them to those who could afford to pay for marble when they might adorn a thousand homes of people of taste who have more appreciation than they have money to testify it with. Plaster casts are as compared with biscuit or parian, so frail and they require so much care in a sea voyage that there's a great objection to them." Unquote. After praising Durham for avoiding frivolous subjects like Venuses and dolphins, Stowe returned to parian. One of my favorite ideas is the making of good art so cheap that every young couple entering life shall be able to have in their rooms forms of ideal beauty and of suggestions of noble sentiments. I think that's important here. I have felt the want of soul and expression in many of the Parian works, and yet I rejoice in their advent because it distributes works of art through all the middle classes. Where a nation of people with moderate fortunes and great wealth is as much the exception as poverty. But there's now a great awakening of attention to art in the body of the people and engravings and statuettes meet every year increasing sale. And whenever I see a valuable thought or beautiful form, I want to see it distributed far and wide among the people. Toward the end of the letter, Stowe returns to Warburg. Since seeing you, Durham, I've called on Mr. Warburg and found him as I expected in poverty and distress. I'm going to make an effort to raise enough among different friends to pay his present debts and enable him to hire a respectable studio where he may have the means of working with better light and better means than at present. He has a genuine enthusiasm for art. And as you remarked, there was that in him which might be brought out and developed. Your encouraging word for and to him just at this crisis has been of great value, and I trust you will still continue to feel a friendly care of him. There is a hard bridge to be crossed to success in every art, and they who are upon it ought to have sympathy of those who have entered the palace of success on the other side." Unquote. Uncle Tiff remained almost the only representation of characters from dread in the English speaking world. Though the book was very widely read, its reception was mixed due to its more radical tone in highlighting the evils of slavery as compared to Stowe's first novel. There are a few pictures in Dutch and French editions. No early images are known in the US and in England, the only work that has come to light is a print, perhaps a proof for an illustrated edition that never reached publication most probably by EVB, Eleanor Veer Crombie Boyle, an accomplished illustrator, mostly known for her work on beautifully designed books for children. The scene represented is one in which Nina Gordon, a kind but ill-fated young white North Carolinian and the orphan owner of a plantation, reads from the Bible to Tiff and the poor white children under his care. As in Warburg's work, Tiff has a child on his knee, but here Tiff is submissive and abject, almost like one of the children. And he is perhaps meant to evoke the most famous product of the Staffordshire potteries related to abolition, Wedgwood's Am I Not a Man and a Brother. In contrast, Tiff has much more agency in Warburg's sculpture. The Parian work may have helped sustain Warburg for the moment, but his sights were already directed further afield. Sutherland, Stowe, and Lady Byron 
collectively raised the sum of money enabling Warburg to embark on study in Italy, still the holy grail of every American sculptor of the period. In 1857, he left London, visiting Germany, maybe Hamburg, and arriving in Venice in July. There he encountered a party of five Americans, including three painters and the abolitionist writer Carolyn Sturgis Tappan. One of the painters wrote, we had a call from Eugene Warburg, a Negro sculptor from New Orleans, on his way to Florence and out of money. His manner was prepossessing. He had letters from people we knew. He was modest, but full of hope and confidence. Together, we Americans made up a purse for him the next day and sent him on his way rejoicing. End of quote. By November, Warburg reached Florence, where American newspaper accounts cite the arrival of, quote, a mulatto sculptor from New Orleans, unquote, bearing letters of recommendation from the unlikely trio of Soule, Stowe, and Sutherland. Warburg tried to settle in Florence, and as in New Orleans attempted to raffle a marble sculpture entitled The First Kiss, depicting a young woman kissing a dove perched on her shoulder, but he is said to have encountered racial hostility, perhaps from the white American expatriate artists in the city, and therefore moved on to Rome. Warburg lived in Rome for about a year until his untimely death in January of 1859. Despite our ability to follow much of Eugène Warburg's complex career, there remains a lot we do not know. Sometimes the, ed the evidence is contradictory. He definitely had a German-born immigrant wife back in New Orleans who never left the city and a daughter by her. Monsell Field writes of a, quote, charming quadroon wife, unquote, who accompanied Warburg to London. An apostomous account claims Warburg married a Florentine maiden during his stay in that city. Warburg's Roman death records list his wife as Louise Ernestine Rosebow. We have no detailed record of Warburg's own appearance. No photograph of him survives. Some textual sources make no reference to his racial identity. Others speak of him as colored, Negro, mulatto, mixed blood, and quadroon. None of these sources on Eugène Warburg significantly mention his Jewish heritage. Stowe's dread has several mixed race protagonists. Did Warburg select the more intensely African kiff, or was this Stowe's or Sutherland's preference? Darker skin enslaved domestic servants probably helped to raise Eugène Warburg. Did he therefore identify more with his kiff or with the white child on the bondsman's lap? Warburg's early death makes it hard to assess his impact. Though his demise was reported in several American newspapers, the turbulence of the Civil War's, War years disrupted the milieu in which he had flourished. When the next expatriate African-American sculptor, Edmonia Lewis, arrived in Rome after the war, was she aware of Warburg as a forerunner? Lewis was assisted by another white American abolitionist, Lydia Maria Child, but no trace of Warburg's name is to be found in Child's writings or in contemporary discussions of Lewis's work. Hints of Warburg's career and influence might be present in Nathaniel Hawthorne's novel, The Marble Fawn, and in several sculptures made by expatriate British and American artists who had spent time in Rome, but more research will be needed to flesh out these possibilities. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Paul. I will invite those around the table to reveal themselves uh, and unmute themselves. And um, we can proceed to questions. Casper. Um, thank you very much. I was I, I never heard of uh, Eugene Warburg before, but that was really really interesting. Um, I was going to have a have a question about the the dread. Um, um, uh, Perry and start uh, sculpture. Actually, first of all, I mean, what are the dimensions? Uh, like most Perry and sculptures, it's about a foot high. Right. Okay. That's that's the general. There's statuettes is the proper term. 
right. I, w I was um, sort of going to, first when you said about agency, I was going to so, so fully agree and say that, um, that if you have a portrait seated like this, it's a rather dignified pose. It's almost like, you know, the, the Voltaire, the seated Voltaire uh, or something <laughs> like that. Right. Um, but obviously with a, with a much simpler seat and, and, and the, the actually there is the, this, this genre kind of um, a detail included of the child and so on. But then I was going to uh, suddenly uh, thought, is it not actually a bookend? Was designed no, no, they, they, they were not used functionally. Right. right. Okay. I think the Staffordshire figures, which were very inexpensive, about maybe a twentieth the price, right, uh, of this kind of thing. These these were intended, I think, for for the mantle, right. Um, uh, we can see sometimes they were put up there, uh, but they were meant to be. They were they were meant to be the equivalent of an engraving, let's say, of a painting. That is to say, a reproduced work. Right. Uh, some of the Parian works actually are miniature reproductions. Of well-known works, uh, typically in marble, right, by other sculptors, and there are many Italian works that were designed by fairly noted sculpt sculptors of the period. Uh, others were made specifically only in Parian, and we have no evidence that Warburg tried to render these figures in marble. Uh, right. He might, probably might might have wanted to. I, I have a feeling uh, had he received such a commission, uh, uh, but. No evidence that that happened or was, you know, floated. Great. Thank you very much. That was interesting. Uh, Catherine, please. Um, Paul, thank you very much for that talk. It was really, really interesting. And it's not actually history I was familiar with uh, at all, even as an Americanist. Uh, but I wanted to hear some thoughts about you know, kind of the genre of these uh, statuettes as you've, you've um, you're calling them and how you th see this as work fitting into that. I'm thinking specifically of people like John Rogers, right? And the kind of parlor culture, right? Where there's, you know, the biblical scene or there's, you know, there's just, there's scenes um, that have to do with Stowe. Um, and how, how does this relate to that? Because it seems like it's cost-wise, it's probably a step up. Um, I, yeah, well, I, I'm so happy you raised Rogers. Um, I, I won't go back to my presentation. If we have time, we can look at it at the end. But Rogers arrived in Rome uh, about a month after Warburg's death. And he trained with a British sculptor, sculptor, Benjamin Spence, who had been in Rome for some time. And while I can't prove Spence knew Warburg, I think it's likely they had encountered each other. And uh, Spence actually created shortly thereafter uh, a large sculptural ensemble, not a Parian thing with a black character in it. Uh, so he was interested in, in issues of race and probably abolition. He had connections to Liverpool abolitionists and so on. Uh, I actually think that Rogers' uh, uh, small plasters uh, might reflect him having seen uh, mm -hmm. Warburg's work. Mm -hmm. uh, because of course they start right out with quote unquote racial subjects, right? The subject of slavery. Um, so I can't prove that, um, uh, uh, but uh, I think there's a, at least some kind of case to be made that there's a, a real link there. I, I don't know price wise, I, 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 I'd be interested in your, your view about what you think, if, if this work was offered at the time for 31 shillings and six pence, how would that match up with Rogers work at the time. I don't know enough about the cost of Rogers work, though I know it was intended for a similar audience. Yeah, I, I mean, my feeling is just the level. Uh, I don't, first of all, I don't know exactly yeah. what the price point was of, yeah. of those objects, but I think given the materials, like the painted plaster, um, you know, then again, you know, I think bronze would have been more expensive, um, but right. just the, the level of what they're produced, the scale yeah. of production, um, yeah. makes me think that they would have been more affordable, um, you know, on that, even on that basis alone, as well as the materials. Absolutely. Absolutely. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. Um, Par Parian, one, one thing to know about Parian is um, that, uh, well, it was pourable, right? Mm -hmm. uh, 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 so really, the, the reproduction process could take place relatively quickly, but it had a it's much more marble-like surface. Uh, because there was a lot of feldspar in the mix that apparently gave it that sheen, uh, which more closely approximates marble. Very fine surface. <laughs>
Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Aaron? Thanks for the talk. I, I have a biographical question, which I assume the answer uh, to which is no, because otherwise you would have told us. But <laughs> when you were um, when you were talking about him moving through Europe, um, in part um, in pursuit of patrons, um, is there any evidence that he reached out to the Warburgs passing through Germany? Is there any sense that he tried to capitalize on his name, on those family connections? Were those cut off to him? Do we know anything right. about any of that potential uh, route? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, again, I can, I can say a few suggestive things, but nothing definite. Um, I know that Eugene Warburg was cousin to A.B. Warburg because in 1937, not a very auspicious moment, the Warburg family in Hamburg uh, published an enormous genealogy. And both Daniel Warburg and uh, Eugene Warburg are listed in that genealogy. So at some level, the, the Warburgs in Hamburg knew about them, OK? Uh, the only suggestion that he might have gone to Hamburg is that in De Dune's um, biography, which is partly based on this sort of um, sort of uh, ceremonial account of Warburg's life published in 1862, but partly based on oral tradition, uh, because uh, uh, Eugène's brothers were also in the marble trade and continued to work in New Orleans up into the early 20th century. Uh, anyway, De Dune in 1911 says that he went to Germany. Uh, Germany was not a major destination for American sculptors. It was a major destination for American painters. They went to Dusseldorf, right? Um, and so the thought has occurred to me that in going to Germany, he was going to Hamburg to try to find some of his cousins. But I have at this point, no evidence that he did. But it it would be kind of in line with his his mode a little bit to look for patronage wherever he could find it. Yeah. Um, hand up, uh, Deborah. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. That was incredibly interesting. One of these pieces of recovery that it's always surprising how much there is that's still just completely unexplored. That is of such great interest. Um, you may have said something about this that I missed, but do we know anything about the commercial dimension of um, of this kind of, I mean, I'm parrying in general, I know we know a lot about it, but this particular work, how many copies were made, how many survive, like what, who bought it, where it was for sale, that sort of thing? Uh, I, I can tell you a little bit about that. Um, uh, but I, I want to emphasize that I am not what I know about Perry and I have learned only in this particular piece of research. I don't come from that uh, uh, world. And there are some excellent specialists uh, you know, in Perry. Uh, there are a couple of really good books that inventory practically the entire production of Perry and have lots to say about the level of production and so on. Um, and I can certainly refer you to those. Anyway, uh, what would I say about this? Um, uh, it was, I think, fairly successful. Uh, it, it went on um, uh, in a major way for perhaps 25 or 30 years, from 1845 into the 1870s. I understand there's still some factory in Ireland that makes Parian objects. Um, uh, but I think it, it dropped off uh, in the 1870s, right? Uh, and I think a lot of it was made by major companies. Copeland is what I'm talking about in this presentation, Minton, which was another major pottery uh, in the Midlands, also had a major production of Parian. And I think there are, in some cases, records of dozens or even hundreds of the objects being produced. So um, they were apparently quite easy to create another edition of. Uh, so the molds would be sort of held out. And then if it was necessary, uh, there would be another edition. In other cases, things didn't sell. And I found some pictures of things where it said that the mold was destroyed because they no longer anticipated selling any of them. Right? <coughs> um, uh, uh, people, even fairly wealthy people, sometimes owned Parian works. I think Stowe did have several Parian works. She also owned a bronze statue, 
of a black woman by a Franco uh, uh, British artist, um, uh, which was also reproduced in Parian and had fairly wide sale, I believe, because there's a number of examples surviving. This work, we at most know of two of them. The one that resurfaced in about 2012, which is owned by an American collector outside of New Orleans. There's also a photograph in one of the earlier, I think from the 1980s books on Parian, right? Whether that is the same copy as the work now outside of New Orleans, I don't know. I suspect it isn't, okay? Uh, but those are the only potentially two examples of this work that I, that I know of. Um, oh. yeah, and I don't, I don't have a location for that one that appeared in the photograph uh, mm -hmm. in the Parian volume. Um, but if you're if you're curious, send me an email and, and I'll uh, I'll direct you to the to the studies of Parian. It's become a collector's item, and consequently, there's a lot of information about size of editions and so on um, because that's of concern. Obviously. Yeah, you you we we just by coincidence have an exhibition about Majolica that just opened two days ago, and there's. Um, at least something, you know, Parian is discussed there because it's a, a lot about Minton and the market for it. But I was just curious how much information there was about this particular work. No, about this particular work, uh, essentially nothing, right? Um, that, that anyone has, has recovered, been able to recover, yeah. Thank uh, you. Yeah. <laughs> so Paul, actually from, from the Q&A, just on this point, uh, Karen Lemmy is asking, hey, do, the Minton, do the Minton archives have any information that could be useful for you? Uh, uh, one of the people who has assisted me a little bit in, in my research, well, Minton wouldn't have anything because this is Copeland, right? Um, but there's been some attempt to get more inf information from the Copeland archives that's been unsuccessful. Um, uh, 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 the, the owner uh, of the object took that route and didn't get anywhere. Um, so I don't know if that means they just don't want to deal with it or whether there's nothing there to provide. Um, probably worth another shot, but probably something that needs to happen in person rather than by uh, email. So Earl Martin, one of the curators of the exhibition uh, Deborah Crone mentioned on Majolica asks, presumably Warburg's model was made in some multiples as it was Parian. Do you yeah. have a sense of what the numbers now? I don't. And, and in reading through the Parian literature, it's clear <clears throat> that, I mean, I can't imagine that they didn't make, let's say 10 or 12 of these objects to put them out there to, to see, right? Did they make a hundred? No evidence of that, certainly. And there are many other, um, there are many other Parian objects that exist in many more examples, okay, in dozens of examples today at least. So I, I don't, I don't think it's likely that this was a hugely successful um, design in terms of the numbers that were sold, just because. Uh, and I, I first published something about this in 2014. No other works have come out of the woodwork since then. I'm hoping now that my book is out from last year that other people will look at it and I will eventually hear. But in <laughs> a year or so since the publication of the book, nobody's gotten in touch with me as I, I would think they might if they happen to have the object. So my guess is that it was not a huge success, um, uh, but no way of knowing for sure. Right. Uh, Ivan. Thanks, Peter. And Paul, it's good to see you. It's been been quite a while. Great to see you, Ivan. <laughs> it's Great. a dangerous skip at the uh, in uh, in Cambridge, Mass. Yes. Um, I want to ask. Uh, I want to do something that might be a little a little cheeky. You may not. Uh, you may not welcome this, but I'd like to just shift the focus of attention to one of your uh, one of your supporting characters, and that's um, Harriet, Duchess of Sutherland. Yeah. Uh, and I think of her, I mean, she's a much, obviously a much better known character in terms of, of historical familiarity than, than Eugène Warburg. Um, but I think of her in relation to the bedchamber crisis. 
uh, and of 1839 and how important that was and of her relationship with Queen Victoria. She was quite clearly quite close to Queen Victoria. Uh, what I wanted to ask you about is, do you have any evidence of her other possible sponsorship of artists or patronage uh, of other artists? Uh, I don't really. Um, there's, there's, there's not that much out there on her, surprisingly enough. Hmm. Okay? I mean, she is, of course, discussed. She's a major figure. Uh, she has different kinds of manifestations. Of course, you know, uh, Marx famously criticized the Sutherlands uh, for their behavior in terms of uh, pushing people off the land in Scotland. Um, uh, they were celebrities in their own day, and she's not ignored at present. But I haven't come across much that involves her cultural policy. Her husband was a great collector. Uh, her father had also been a great collector. And here's a very odd thing that I'm wait was waiting for the chance to bring up. Um, if if Warburg made it to Stafford House, okay, uh, he would have seen one of Torvaldson's Ganymede sculptures. Okay. Um, so she's affiliated with great collectors, but her interests were far more directed toward abolition. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, sort of, you know, kind of re reinforcing the sort of area around the queen and so on. Um, she, she doesn't seem to have had an elaborate um, uh, art patronage trail. Mm -hmm. in, in that respect, I think it's a little bit easier to think of Stowe as pushing this, right? Stowe, in fact, was very interested in the visual arts. She was herself uh, an amateur, but not unskilled artist. Um, and she collected a number of, of interesting objects, some of which can still be seen in the Harriet Stowe House, in um, Harriet Beecher Stowe House in Hartford. Um, so she's, of the two, she's the one with a higher, higher likelihood, I think, of sort of, of having come up with this idea somehow. But it was an idea that could happen because of Sutherland's connections, I believe. And of course, the Stafford House had, a, had one of the most celebrated purpose-built galleries of the time in London. Absolutely. Great collection. So it would be interesting to know whether Warburg had uh, access to that. It would, it, would be, it would be wonderful to know. I, I'll tell you one, one, uh, one, one terrible uh, frustration about my research here. I found the letter in which Stowe discusses Warburg um, at the Harry Beecher Stowe House in Hartford. Uh, a scholar some years ago assembled all her letters and put it, if you can remember such a primitive device, on a CD-ROM, uh, which can only, I think, still be consulted there. A lot of Stowe's letters have been published, uh, but this was an unpublished one that he located. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I, I saw it there, and of course, I was thrilled to see it. But in am among her published letters, were for right around the same time, a letter published by her son in a grand collection. The son quotes from the letter. It's a long letter. And then in this edition, which is the only place it's been published, the son says the rest of the, the letter is devoted to a charity for an unfortunate artist that Stowe and uh, uh, Lady Byron were involved with, but I forbear to quote it. That letter is I have no idea where it is. It's never been published. Uh, I, have, I have no clue. There is another letter out there that would tell us a lot more about this interaction, right? Uh, and maybe it will surface, but I haven't found it. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> I think, Paul, students have to go back to class. We have time for one more question. Sure. Um, and it's coming from the Q&A from uh, Andrew Morrill. Oh, there's actually, wait, um, Earl Martin has just chimed in. Uh, with the other curator, Laura McCrulis, writing, the Duchess of Southern Sutherland was a strong supporter of industry in Staffordshire and gave important examples of Minton and Majolica to Princess Royal Queen Victoria on her marriage in 1856. She was instrumental in fostering the early career of Carlo Marochetti. So more oh, information okay. coming out of, That's good. I'll have out to of look the ceramic world. Marochetti. 
But here's the question for you from Andrew Morrill, a faculty member at the BGC. Is there evidence that the Copeland works use the Parian medium to disseminate abolitionist sentiments, ideas more widely than just this one piece? Um, I, I'm not remembering if it's Copeland or Minton, but uh, you remember I already mentioned a bronze image of a young black woman, which goes by several different titles by Charles Cumberworth, right? A, a Anglo-French sculptor of the middle of the century. Uh, Stowe um, uh, acquired um, the bronze, but Parian was fairly widely distributed. I think a number of examples are left. Of course, one of the challenges to this is Parian was by definition white, it was marble white. So actual color was not easy to add, although there are some examples of tinted Parian as well. A little bit later during the Civil War and its immediate aftermath, the British sculptor John Bell uh, had a number of, uh, made a number of sculptures of black women or women of mixed race with a generally abolitionist theme and they were rendered in Parian. And this was, I think, toward the end of the Civil War and after the Civil War, so it's a little bit later. I can't be sure whether it's Minton or, or, or Copeland or even Worcester made some of these objects uh, which they came from, but there was a kind of uh, investment um, in Parian as a kind of abolitionist anti-slavery medium. Yes, I would say so. Well, Paul, thank you very much. It's been um, a wonderful exploration for us, fascinating. and. Um, even all of those moments in your talk and in the Q&A where you virtually threw up your hands at the dead ends, at the things that were tantalizingly out of reach suggests, in fact, from the other perspective, how much more there is to know and how many opportunities there are to explore questions in this paper and in similar kinds of investigations uh, in the years to come. So thank you for doing this work and also for providing uh, inspiration for tackling those other kinds of questions and problems. Um, it's out there somewhere. <laughs> so thank you very much for joining us uh, and my colleagues on the panel in the audience and those uh, joining us from elsewhere today. Um, we're on again tomorrow, same lunchtime. Um, we have another talk, please join us here. Have a good afternoon. Thanks so much. <laughs>